Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the All Things of Field broadcast. This is William Bell, and uh, we're delighted to be with you this morning. I have to admit that this almost didn't happen because I've been ill for the last, since Wednesday evening, and um, been feeling really, really just awful and uh, confined to bed most of the time. And it was only last night that I finally got enough energy to even um, decide to do this because I thought I was coming to the computer to just say, uh, it's not going to happen today. But, you know, I managed to find a little bit of strength and effort to uh, put it together. And so um, this is what um, what I'm going to share with you this morning. So thank you for being here. Hope you understand. And and uh, But I'm not feeling my best uh, this morning. All right. We're talking about the church at Ephesus. I'm sorry, the church at Sardis. And that's Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Uh, we will be uh, looking at this for a few minutes. Uh, good morning to you, Eric. Good morning to you, uh, Beatrice. Uh, just a few uh, points from a historical perspective on Sardis, the city itself, so you can see how some of the things that um, the scripture says about them relates to some of their um, personal history as far as the city was concerned. Um, this is from um, Homer Haley's uh, commentary on Revelation, and of course he is not uh, a preterist by any stretch of the imagination as far as the last I, I heard, and this book is not a preterist book, but it does have some resource information, so I just wanted to share a little bit uh, of that with you. Uh, he says, Sardis, the capital of ancient Lydia was a little more than 30 miles south southeast of Thyatira, lying at the foot of Mount Timulus and about three miles south of the Hermus River. Among the oldest and most renowned cities of Asia Minor, Sardis was built on a smooth, almost perpendicular rock hill that provided a natural citadel, inaccessible from three sides and easily protected on the fort. Rising 1,500 feet from the plain below till uh, the hill overlooked the wide and fertile Hermes Valley. Sardis had long been a capital city. The kings who ruled from it were noted for their life of wealth, splendor, and luxury. They were also known for their tendency to become soft and weak. Ramsey says of the city, it was more of a robber's stronghold than an abode of civilized men in his book, Seven Churches, page 354. And from this capital, Croesus, whose name became synonymous with wealth, had ruled over Lydia in the 6th century BC. Cyrus, king of the Persians, took the city from him in 549 BC. Tradition says that a soldier found a crevice in the rock hill up which he led a band of soldiers to the summit, taking the city by surprise. About 330 years later, in 218 BC, Antiochus the Great took the city in the same way, thus the city had twice been surprised and taken as a thief. I'm sure you can relate to that in reference to what's said about Sardis. It was a city with the past but no future. And um, there were four uh, main points that help us to understand the message to the church at Sardis. And uh, one, each had a name that it lived but was dead. Number two, each fulfilled none of its works, both would promise but fail to execute. Number three, with each, it was watch or be surprised by a thief. Sardis had been caught napping each time it was taken. And number four, it is implied that the garments of the church had been defiled with immorality for with which the church was noted, according to Hastings. Now, let's go ahead and uh, get to uh, the message. And thank you, Carol. I uh, appreciate that very much. Definitely need them. Um, when we enter this chapter, of course, you know, a new letter uh, for these seven churches. And this is um, the fifth one in our series on the seven churches. And... Um, this begins with another reference, in my judgment, to Isaiah chapter 11. He says, and to the angel of the church in Sardis write, these things, says he, who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. 
So we have a couple of uh, references in this verse. And, you know, I'm not sure what other people think about these seven spirits, but I find it interesting, at least from my uh, perspective, that when he talks about seven spirits and you go back to Isaiah uh, 11, and you'll see why I think that Isaiah 11 is um, uh, sort of the backdrop of this context as well as we've seen in, in a couple of other churches or at least one other church um, when he talks about the seven spirits. Now, when we read Isaiah 11 and verse one, it says, there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Well, when I look at these and you count them, they happen to be seven uh, in number. Uh, there are some ellipses going on here. Um, in other words, he doesn't say the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of understanding, but I think that's what the text is indicating. I think that's what it means, at least from my perspective. And I haven't found anything else that um, tends to support that, especially in context of what we're looking at in Revelation chapter 3. And so uh, when we see this, we have the spirit of the Lord as number one, uh, the spirit of wisdom, then the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, and so forth and so on. And I think that might be what his reference is in terms of the seven spirits that's being uh, referenced here. Now, the other point that he makes is that he says, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. And as we've seen from their history, um, that was sort of true of uh, the way the city was, but it also tends to reflect a little bit of the statement that Jesus made that shows a contrast between how the church was and how he was. Excuse me, it seems like something, something's, uh, I don't know whether it was hair or something, but nevertheless, uh, in Revelation 1 and verses 17 and 18, he says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. So in contrast to a church that uh, was said to be alive but was dead, we have the Lord who was dead but is now alive, speaking to them, in order to let them know in view of their condition that he was able to um, remedy the problem that they had. And of course, that was his purpose in writing them was because he wanted to address them regarding the needs that they had and to be able to, um, to uh, cover that. Now, let me see if I've turned on my recorder. Um, sometimes I forget things like that. Okay, so we got that going. Yes, the recorder is going and I'm good. Um, my brain is not functioning the best today, so I have to go back and check these things. All right. Um, the other thing that he says to them in verse two is be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. So there were things that were about to die. Uh, he had not found their works perfect before God, and therefore um, he was warning them that because of that, if they didn't change, uh, that there were going to be consequences for that. And I think the consequences that we find are very uh, interesting in connection with this. So he tells them to remember, therefore, how you have received and heard and hold fast uh, what you uh, hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief. So there's that correlation between the history where they had been captured twice by surprise and uh, the uh, invading nation came upon them as a thief. And so uh, it's possible that Jesus, being aware, of course, of that history, used that language because that was something that would be etched in the minds of those in Sardis. And so he says, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Now, this is where he begins to get into uh, what I think is the crux of the message to the church at Sardis, because uh, in saying that, what he's indicating is that, as we've talked before when we dealt with the multiple coming theory, 
of um, the churches in uh, the book of Revelation that the church of Sardis is certainly uh, a church that is being focused upon from the perspective of the eschatological coming, because this is the only coming that the Bible speaks about where it's stated that uh, they would not know the hour in which he would come, but also that he would come as a thief. Anytime you bring that up, the futurists are going to go to 2 Peter 3, they're going to go to 1 Thessalonians uh, five, and they're going to go to Matthew chapter 25 uh, and talk about the Lord coming, or Matthew 24 in the latter verses, the Lord coming as a thief. And so that would show that this coming that is being referred to in um, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 4 is the same one. But let's entertain them for a moment because their idea is that there is a distinction between Matthew 24 and uh, Matthew 25. And so basically, uh, and actually they start that distinction before Matthew 24 ends, in the very verse, some of them, that is, in the very verse that uses that phrase, but of that day and hour, no one knows, you know, except the Father, etc. And um, so they say, this is where the chapter is divided. And of course, I come from an amillennial background and you know, they had problems dividing it. They couldn't tell whether it's divided in verse 34, verse 35, or verse 36. And either one of them had very severe consequences to them in for as, as far as their um, uh, interpretation was concerned. However, let's say that um, we look at it and we try to use that as a point of division in Matthew 24 and verse 36, where he uses that, that phrase, but of that day and hour, no man knows. And what that means is they would have to, number one, connect that statement with the end time judgment. There is no question. None of them will deny that. That is an absolute fixed uh, premise with them, that it is the end time judgment. Secondly, they also, uh, and that means that it's connected with the entirety of Matthew chapter 25. And of course, all the other uh, end time passages that they want to throw into the pot. Uh, the next point is that it is um, uh, associated with the wedding. Now that's important because of what we're going to uh, read about in Revelation chapter three regarding uh, the church at Sardis, and uh, and that also connects it with the coming as a thief. So all of those are points that are inseparable once you get to verse 36 and read all the way to the end of Matthew 25. So Matthew 24, 36 down to Matthew 25 talks about the coming of the Lord as a thief. It talks about the coming in judgment, and it talks about the wedding of the Messiah. So all of those are the same. So that means that when we're looking at Revelation chapter 3 and verse um, 4, uh, or verse 3, that we're dealing with the eschatological coming, the end time coming, and, and that just serves to further support the fact that there's only one coming that is referred to in the book of Revelation. Now, uh, and, and that that also ties in with what we said before um, on Hebrews 9, 28, that he would appear a second time apart from sin for salvation, that, that brings in that priestly aspect of the coming of the Lord and the day of atonement. And it's again, John 14 and uh, Revelation 1, 7. And by the way, John 14 is a wedding uh, motif as well. Now, that's why I believe that Isaiah 11 is invoked in the context uh, because of those particular points uh, that we see. Now, another thing that Isaiah 11 incorporates, as we've uh, shown before, was the second exodus. And, uh, and that means that the second exodus is also tied to judgment and marriage. And as you will note, let's just note a couple of correlations there. In Revelation chapter, um, no, no, no. In Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 4, let's go there and read once again from that chapter. And notice how all of this is just tied in beautifully together. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 4, it says, But with righteousness he shall judge the poor. And decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. 
uh, righteousness shall be the belt of his loins and faithfulness the belt of his waist. All right. Now, as we look at that, let's compare it with Revelation chapter 19 and verse 11. And let's see what else is involved in that context where those passages are used. And that's one thing that I uh, really am fond of doing when I look at a passage. I try to see, you know, what's in the landscape? What else is there? You know, it's like walking in a room and observing all the pieces of the furniture and and the uh, uh, accents on the wall, the curtains and everything, instead of just looking at the floor and the ceiling. So what else is in the context? And so when you get to Revelation chapter 19 and you read verse 11, and you can see that it's a direct quote, basically from Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 4. But let's look. It says, now I saw heaven open and behold, a white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true. Now watch. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. Where is that from? That's from Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 4. Uh, Isaiah 11 and verse 4. So that shows you that we're dealing with the context of Isaiah 11, 4, even in Revelation chapter 3. But now watch what's associated with the context. This is the context of the wedding. In verses 7 and 8, let us be glad and rejoice. Give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her, it was granted to be arrayed or clothed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints, or the righteousness of the saints is what I prefer. And so um, this is the time of the marriage and the marriage supper, when he judges and makes war. But also, as you saw uh, in Isaiah, which talks about uh, the, the um, rod of his mouth, you find that again in verse 15, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword and with it he should strike the nations and he himself will rule them with the rod of iron we saw that when we talked about the church at Thyatira so from that perspective this is a context about Isaiah 11 it is a context of context about judging uh in righteousness it is also a context about the wedding and the wedding feast and therefore it makes sense therefore when we look at the next verse that we find in uh Revelation chapter 3 because it says in verse 4, you have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Well, what garments are we talking about here? These are the wedding garments. So you can see the correlation between the seven spirits, uh, judging in righteousness, and the wedding garment. All wrapped in one neat little package. In that day and hour, so we can't be talking about a different coming here at all. Uh, this is what this is referring to. And so he says, he, or oh, you have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Now remember what we read in Revelation 19 and verse 8. And to her, it was granted to be clothed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And um, that's the exact same uh, concept and reference that we have in Revelation 3. So this is a wedding, this is wedding terminology, a wedding motif that we find here uh, that it is being spoken of. Now, he says, again, you know, um, that they show, they, uh, excuse me, even in Sardis who have not defiled their garments. Now, wait a minute. How are you going to defile a garment that you're not possessed or that you don't possess, that you do not have? Now, see, this becomes problematic to the futurists, to the um, physical body advocates, because that which clothes them is the resurrection body, if you please. That's the garment that they have put on. And this is no small problem for those who advocate that you have to die first in order to receive this garment. Uh, those who believe that you don't get it until some alleged future return of Christ. 
and those who think that it is a physical body within itself. Just look at the way the Lord addressed them. He said, uh, you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. Well, he couldn't have been talking about their physical life in that statement, was he? Certainly not. And uh, he says that they had these garments, uh, but there were some who had defiled them and some who had not defiled them. You had a few among you in Sardis who had not defiled their garments, for they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Now, just that phrase, they are worthy, you know, that takes you back to Luke chapter 20. When um, the question with the Sadducees about the resurrection of the dead, and Jesus makes this statement, he says, um, those who are worthy and who attain to that age and the resurrection of the dead, uh, he says, they are as the angels of God, neither can they die anymore, being the sons of the resurrection, and at, at the, being the sons of that age and the sons of the resurrection. So this is dealing with the subject of resurrection when he says they are worthy. That's where that language comes from. Um, but also note, that says that they had already begun wearing those garments. Look in Revelation chapter 16, and the verse is 15. Revelation 16 and 15. It says, behold, I am coming as a thief. So there's your thief concept once again, motif. Blessed is he who watches and notice and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So these garments are the garments that cover the nakedness of the body of Christ. And if they didn't watch, he would come upon them as a thief. And uh, he would walk naked and they would see a shame. Well, where do we find that? The idea of that, of course, goes all the way back to Genesis, Genesis with Adam and Eve being naked in the garden. But we also see it emphasized in Ezekiel 16, when God found Israel uh, in the wilderness, unclothed, etc., unwashed, etc., and then she grew and he clothed her. But it's also the same idea of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that everyone, not everyone, all the futurists, et cetera, want to make a physical body resurrection. But see, we're not dealing with physical bodies. We're dealing with covenant bodies. We're dealing with corporate houses here. And that's what this context is all about. Notice, and I'll read a few verses. But we know that if our earthly house, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. The first time you'll see the phrase not made with hands is in Daniel 2, referring to the kingdom of God. That's the house not made with hands. The Most High does not dwell in temples made with men's hands. And that's what the covenant body is all about. It's the temple. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. So this is how they eliminate the nakedness. This is how they get rid of the nakedness. For we who are in this tent, Rome, that's the earthly house, the earthly tabernacle. This is being argued from a Hebraic perspective. And that's demonstrated all the way back from 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We who are in this tent grown being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed that mortality might be swallowed up of life. That's exactly the problem Jesus was addressing in Revelation chapter 3. Now, he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the spirit as a guarantee. So he poured out the gifts, gave them the gifts in order for God to bring this about. To clothe them through the work of the Spirit and the preaching of the gospel and their obedience to it, they were able to put on these heavenly wedding garments to cover the nakedness of their shame, which was sin. And that was the problem that was being dealt with. And so that's what would prevent their nakedness from appearing. Uh, you know, and I, I, I'm not here to call names necessarily, but I've dealt with 
Ed Stevens on this point. As a matter of fact, I did an entire lesson. I invited them to engage me on uh, the points when I was teaching on 1 Corinthians 15, and I was dealing with the concept that the resurrection body was already being put on while the saints were living. They didn't have to wait until they died. That it was already in progress. And it's a point Ed noted in his paper. Um, uh, Gordon Fee notes in his book. And if you go back and find that study that I did on 1 Corinthians 15, verse 49, it was probably the longest one I did in the series. And the same thing with Sam Frost in pointing out, you know, his concept that you die and you go to heaven and get your spiritual body and then come back. None of that works with this context. And I've engaged Sam on Facebook um, in, on another one of the, the group uh, when he tried to address some things here in Second Corinthians. But you've got to deal with them already having their garments, defiling their garments, and yet they're still alive. They hadn't died. So this, this can't be a reference to a physical body. And there, we don't have but one garment that gets rid of the nakedness. And so it's very important for us to understand that. Anyway, it might have uh, labored that a little bit, but I think it's so very, very important that we understand this. What is covering you is the holy house, the tabernacle. That's why at the end of the book of Revelation, what does the scripture say? I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no more sea. That's temple language. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, prepared as a what? As a bride adorned for a husband. That's wedding terminology. And then I heard a loud voice saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And that's where there is no more death, no more crying, no more sorrow, no more tears. But we want to turn it into physical bodies, and that just doesn't work. All right, uh, we're just about out of time here, so let me see what else I can share with you before uh, we actually close. In um, verse 5, he says, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. Well, that's the consummation of the process. We've seen that in Revelation 19, because what that's tied to is the destruction of Mystery Babylon. Mystery Babylon is the great city that was spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. It's the city that was drunken with the blood of the martyrs of the saints. And therefore, God took vengeance on her for murdering the apostles, the prophets, and the saints. Revelation 18, 20, and also verse 24. It's a quote out of Deuteronomy 32, verses 41 and 43. And so that's the point of overcoming. And that's exactly what happens in Revelation 19, 2, when the harlot is judged. Salvation comes. That is the time of the wedding. And that theme is repeated throughout the Gospels. In Matthew 22, it's the destruction of the city. And then the wedding comes. In Matthew 24 and 25, it's the destruction of the temple and the city. And then the wedding of chapter 25. You can even see it in Ephesians chapter 5, if you will note the fact that in chapter 5, he talks about presenting the bride to himself. But if you look in chapter 6, there's the war that's going on in Ephesians 6, 11, and 12. And at the end or the conclusion of that war, which is the same war of Revelation chapter 12 and Revelation 19, and uh, uh, Revelation 19, then you find, again, the wedding occurs. So that theme is, is uh, consistent throughout all the scriptures. I think that's pretty much everything I wanted to share. Let me see if I left anything out. Yes, uh, he says, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So if the church at Sardis repented, of course, uh, God would accept them. The Lord would accept them. He would confess their name uh, before his father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thank you very much for listening, and I uh, appreciate your prayers. Um, I hope you can take this, share it with others. Uh,
be sure and uh, share the message with your family and friends, and uh, we'll see you on next week. May God bless you all, and um, have a great, um, a great day and a great week. God bless.